Good afternoon for everyone. Today, the speaker is Lee Snopsch from Universidade Federal do Rio de Janeiro. He will talk about fratin injective and maximal propi Galois groups. Okay, Sheila, thank you very much for the invitation and for giving me the opportunity to talk in this wonderful seminar, actually, this semester. And yes, again, I'm honored to give a talk at UNIB after three years. I think last time I talked in 2017. Okay, today I'm going to talk about Fratini injectivity and maximal propi Galois groups. And this is a joint work with Slobodan Tanushevsky. And actually it has been a work that we have been doing over the last two to three years, more or less, but we finished writing the paper two weeks ago. So it's already available, available on the archive. Great, so let me start. So let us start with the definition of a Fratini group, Fratini subgroup. So given a group G, the Fratini subgroup of G, which will be denoted by PG here, is the intersection of all maximal subgroups of G, okay? And clearly when we have finite groups, all finite groups have maximal subgroups, but in the case of infinite groups, there are subgroups which do not have maximal groups. And in that case, if G has no maximal subgroups, one defines Fratini G to be G, okay? But I know that all group, for all group theories, this is clear. But just as an example, what is a Fratini subgroup of Q? It is not difficult to see that Q does not have maximal subgroups. For that reason, just by definition, Fratini of Q is equal to Q. On the other side, what is Fratini of Z? So in Z, if you look at maximal subgroups, every subgroup of the form PZ, where P is a prime, is maximal. But of course, if you intersect these subgroups, you will get that the intersection is one. For that reason, Fratini of Z is equal to one. And in general, Fratini subgroup, we say that the Fratini subgroup is a set of non-generators, but I will not need this actually here. That's why I will not discuss that aspect. But I would like to discuss, let's say, in the case of finite P groups. Whenever we have a finite P group G, then the Fratini of G is equal to GP times the commutator, where this GP here is the group generated, the subgroup generated by all pth powers, okay? So the Fratini group, in the case of a finite P group, can be given as a verbal subgroup. It's very nicely given, and it plays a key role in the study of P groups. But of course, in this talk, the main object will be propy groups, which are inverse limits of finite P groups, right? So in the case of propy groups, again, we get a similar formula. So if G is a propy group, then the Fratini of G is the closure of GP times the commutator GG but we have to take the topological closure in this case. Okay, and why is nice the Fratini for finite P groups and propy groups? For finite P groups and propy groups, Fratini is nice because if we take K a subgroup of H, then Fratini of K is a subgroup of Fratini of A. So Fratini is order preserving in some sense, okay? So as an example of a propy group, let us take the ring of Piadic integer, right? In the ring of periodic integers, what is the Fratini of this ring? It's P times ZP. Okay, I use an additive notation here, but it follows from this formula immediately. Commutator is trivial and G to the P is ZP to the P, which I will write in this way. Great. But now, since during this talk, we are going to deal with topological groups because propy groups actually are topological groups, which are uh, compact and totally disconnected and where every open subgroup has an index of power of P. So in this case, throughout this talk, P will stand always for a prime number and we will take group theoretic terms in the appropriate sense for topological groups. So in this case, subgroups are assumed to be always closed, homomorphisms are continuous, generators are topological generators. Okay, so this is a setup. Next, I will try to uh, give the main definition of this talk, Fratini injective propy group. We say that a propy group G is Fratini injective if the function from H to Fratini of H from the set of finitely generated subgroups of G into itself is injective, okay? 
So what does it mean a Pratini injective propy group? A Pratini injective a propy group is a group where whenever two subgroups, two finitely generated subgroups have same Fratinis, then these subgroups must be equal, okay? So please keep in mind, we will see like two or three definitions, new definitions in this talk. This is the most crucial one and the first one. So this is Fratini injectivity. H to pH is injective. Great. So do we know examples of Fratini injective groups? Okay, if you find that group theorists may try to think a little bit, but they will get stuck. We will see the reason in a second. But actually, if you just take the simplest group that we mentioned today, the periodic integer, ZP, is Fratini injective. And why? The reason in the case of ZP is very simple. We just noticed that the Fratini of ZP is PZP. But every non-trivial subgroup of ZP is what? It's again out of isomorphic to ZP. So whenever we take, if we take two subgroups H and K inside ZP, then Fratini of H equal to Fratini of K, what does it mean? It means that PH is equal to PK, but this automatically from here, we'll get that H is equal to K because we are inside the torsion free group here. Okay, ZP is torsion free here. So in some sense, we can think in this way, and basically, we can do more or less the same thing. Slightly more complicated, but the same idea. All free abelian propy groups are Fratini injective, okay? Great. So for now, the definition of Fratini injectivity is clear, and we know that the set of Fratini injective propy groups is non-empty. Next, let us see some obvious property, or actually some basic properties of Fratini injective propy groups. The first fact, Fratini injectivity, of course, is obviously hereditary property. That is, every subgroup of a Fratini injective propy group is Fratini injective. This clearly follows directly from the definition. There is no group here, right? The second fact, which is, not the, which is quite easy actually to see is, Fratini injective propy groups is necessarily torsion free. That's why I said that among finite groups, we cannot find Fratini injective groups. Of course, we take the trivial one, but we not consider, we will not consider the trivial subgroup in this talk. Okay, so why a Fratini injective propy group is necessarily torsion free? So if a propy group G has a non trivial element of finite order, then of course it has an element, say X of order P, but what is Fratini of X? It will be X to the P. Okay, it is a cyclic group. So the commutator is abelian. So here we have X to the P, which is the identity. But the Fratini of the identity is identity as well. So automatically the condition for Fratini injectivity does not hold. Therefore, Fratini injective propy groups are necessarily torsion free. But even more, we can see that Fratini injective, it's not actually very difficult to see that Fratini injective groups satisfy the unique extraction of roots. So if you take two elements X and Y, and you have X to the alpha is equal to Y to the alpha, then X must be equal to Y, okay? This is so for not just they are torsion free, but they satisfy the unique extraction of roots property. Anyway, I will, the next property, so I will try to count just a couple of properties. The next one, I denote it as a proposition is the following. Let G be a Fratini injective propy group then every finitely generated subgroup H of G satisfies the following property. If K is an open subgroup of H, then the minimal number of generators, I denote by D, the minimal number of generators of K is greater or equal than the minimal number of generators of H. And now you can see that being Fratini injective, it's actually quite a strong property. So this is like monotonicity. If you give me a group, one of your favorite groups, very rarely your group will satisfy such a property. Of course, so uh, let's say you have like free propy groups satisfy such a property. The Mushkin group satisfies such a property, or there is a very good result of Desi and Pavel, and they have shown such a thing in the propy limit groups, but it's really very rarely that such a thing is satisfied, okay? Anyway, so for now, I will stop giving other properties of Fratini injective groups. And I already want to go to a classification problem. So the point is that, okay, we already know that Fratini injective groups satisfy certain properties. So can we classify certain Fratini groups? So since my favorite class of groups are periodic analytic groups, 
the first thing that I will discuss is in the case of periodic analytic groups. So the next result tells us all periodic analytic groups which are Spratini injective. Okay, so with Slobodan, we prove the following. Let G be a periodic analytic property group of dimension greater or equal to one. Then G is Fratini injective, if and only if it is isomorphic to one of the following groups. We have ZPD, the pre abelian group, which we already discussed that they are Fratini injective. And we have only groups of this type. The metabelian group, which is a semi direct product of X with ZPD minus one, where X is isomorphic is the cyclic group of order infinite order, so it's the periodic integers. And this X acts on ZPD minus one, a scalar multiplication by lambda, with lambda equal to one plus PS for some S greater or equal to one. And on the other side, it acts as lambda equal to one plus T two to the S for some S greater or equal to two, if P is equal to two. Actually, if you think as a presentation, if you give generators y1, y2, yd minus one to zp, then the only non, uh, so the relations we are commutators, but the only non commutator relations are relations of the form x, y1 is equal to y1 to the ps. Okay, so it's a very beautiful relation. Great, so this is the theorem. So, okay, I would like just briefly to give an idea why it, this holds. So now I know that there are many people in the audience that they deal with powerful groups, okay? So let me just briefly try to explain something. First of all, if you look at this group, this group satisfies the following property. So the first one is clear, abelian groups. But why this group, the second class is Pratini injective? All those groups are powerful, but not just they are powerful, they are of course torsion free, they are uniform groups. And if you look at its open subgroups or even closed subgroups, they will have a similar shape. Of course, the constant lambda will change. So what's going on in this case? All these groups, in some sense, all the subgroups are uniform. But to uniform groups, we can associate ZPD algebras. And basically, if you look at the subgroups, we can think that as Lie algebras. And since they are uniform, if you have a powerful group, its Fratini is just P times the group or G to the P in some sense, it's G to the P. In the case, it's the same thing as in the case of ZP. So in this case, what do we get? We get that Lie algebras, PL is equal to P to the K, if and only if L is equal to K. So more or less just an idea, don't worry, because there are too many things to be done. I don't want to talk more. But now, why those are the only groups? Okay, it is difficult to answer this in general. But let me give you why, why a Pratini injective periodic analytic group is virtually this group. I just want to give an idea. So if G is periodic analytic, then G contains an open subgroup, which is powerful, H. Okay, what is a powerful group? The commutator of H is, is containing H to the P. So this is a, just a definition, but it's irrelevant here. So if H is powerful, so G contains a powerful open subgroup H. But what do we know for powerful groups? If you look at the minimum number of generators of its subgroups, they are always less or equal than the minimum number of generators of H. So whenever you take a subgroup K, DH is greater or equal to DK, but the group is Fratini injective. And in the previous property, we just said, Fratini injective groups satisfy the other direction. DK is equal, greater or equal to DH. So, we have dk greater or equal to dh, and from powerfulness, we have that dh is greater, dk is greater, dh is greater or equal to dk. So which means dh must be equal to dk. So if you have g, and if you look at this powerful subgroup, then g satis h satisfies the constant number of generators property. So h has the same number of generators with all of its open subgroups. But determining the groups with this property was a part of one section of my PhD thesis. And actually all powerful groups with such property are exactly these two groups, okay? So basically this is how we get that it is virtually. But now how to prove the whole problem? To prove the whole problem, we need to solve an extension problem. And actually an extension problem is quite delicate. It's maybe the most delicate thing that in this theory that we have done so far. 
Okay, so it uh, has like seven, eight pages proof, but anyway, it's doable. Good. So we are done with periodic analytic groups. What next, one may ask? Okay, I see Desi is here. Desi will ask, okay, what can you say about solvable tropy groups? Because that's the next thing where maybe we can do something, okay? But actually, it turns out that even in the case of Pratini injective solvable tropy groups, those groups are quite scarce. There are not too many, okay? So let us read the second classification result. Let G be a solvable tropy group. Then G is Pratini injective, if and only if it is free abelian, okay? Or isomorphic to a semi-direct product. Again, X, semi-direct product with A, where A is ZP, but X is, the X generates a cyclic group of infinite order, ZP, and A is a free abelian propy group. And X, X acts on A is scalar, scalar multiplication by one plus PS with S greater or equal to one if P is off and S greater or equal to two if P is two. Okay? So one will say, but what is new here? You already gave these groups in the previous slide. Don't forget, we deal with periodic analytic groups. So in the previous slide, this A was finitely generated. Here it shouldn't be finitely generated, okay? So in this case, this A is, it could be, it's just a free abelian property group. It could be of any rank, okay? So now, but, okay. Uh, but if you, if we want to connect with the previous group, we will say that these groups are locally periodic analytic of the form that I just mentioned. So every finitely generated subgroup of these groups will have that shape, okay? So what is the proof here? Of course, this theorem in the proof, we use the periodic analytic case, but also model theory enters into the game because there are a couple of troubles that we have. So in general, you can have such a group, such a direct product, semi-direct product, such that the group itself is finitely generated, but this A is not finitely generated, okay? Those are metabelian groups, so weird things can happen. But using a little bit of model theory combined with the previous results, we managed to prove that such a theorem holds. Okay, excellent. So for now we have these two things. So using this theorem, this is not just a nice classification theorem, but it allows us to prove another property of Pratini injective groups. And this property is not so basic. The proof is a little bit more involved and it crucially uses this theorem. So what is this property? What satisfies Pratini injective property groups? So the following gives a complete description of the lattice of a billion normal subgroups of a Pratini injective property group. So we can really have a good control of, a, of the lattice of a billion normal subgroups whenever we have a Pratini injective property group. So what's going on here? Let G be a Pratini injective property group. Then G has a unique maximal normal abelian subgroup N. Moreover, the following assertions hold. N is isolated in G. What does this mean? If you take an element of G and if a power of an element of G belongs in N, then the element itself belongs to N. This is not such a common property in general. Every subgroup of N is normal in G, okay? If the center of G is, tri is non-trivial, then this unique abelian subgroup must be the center. And the last property is the following. If the center of G is equal to one, but N is different than one, then G is isomorphic to this semi-direct product. Okay, it's isomorphic to ZP semi-direct product ZGN. Moreover, the center of ZGN is equal to N. Okay, so this is a nice characterization, in my opinion, of this normal, of the lattice of abelian normal subgroups. Okay, good. So now, what is the point? So, so far we saw a few classification theorems and basically until now I just used exclusively Pratini injectivity property, okay? And so this was the main definition of this talk. But I, ask I, was, I yeah. I'm puzzled here a little bit. Uh -huh. uh, so you take Fratini injective property group and then uh, G has obligatorily unique maximal normal abelian subgroup N. Yes. But you don't say it, this is non-trivial. It can be trivial. I don't say it. I don't say it. Yeah, what, what you will have, what you will get in the, yeah, let's say in the case of free property group. Yeah, and will be trivial. Yes. Okay. Yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. 
So that's why you see the point is that this solvability thing plays a key role here, but I don't say uh, exactly. Some strange groups may happen. It will be more clear later on what is the structure of these groups. So you will see that what is going on, but so far nothing. And I just have used exclusively Pratini injectivity property with the definition as I have given. I haven't used any other theory so far, but now there is a natural question. Uh, so how we can restrict more the Pratini injectivity property? For that reason, I will give you now two new definitions. So as I say here, there are two obvious ways of sharpening the Pratini injectivity condition. And what is the first one? The first one, I guess that all of you can guess immediately. So I assume that Pratini, the function from H to Pratini of H is injected for all finitely generated subgroups. But the question is that instead of confining to finitely generated subgroups, we can take all subgroups into consideration. In this way, we define the following concept. We call a property group G strongly Fratini injective. If the function H from H to Fratini of H from the set of all subgroups of G into itself is injective. Okay? So this is strongly Fratini injective uh, notion. Good. So strongly just means that instead of finitely generated subgroups, we consider all subgroups. But what is, another general, what is another way to sharpen the definition of Pratini injectivity? So another way is the following. What do we have? We know we have the set. So Pratini is order preserving things. So if you look at, we have an order map actually from Pratini injective from the finitely generated group, from, finitely generated subgroups or all subgroups of a group G to, Prati, to the Pratini subgroups, okay? But in this case, what we may ask? We may, ask, we may require that this map to be an embedding of posets, okay, of partially ordered sets. And actually we may ask slightly stronger property. So property group G is defined to be Pratini resistant. If for all finitely generated subgroups H, of G, H and K of G, H is a subgroup of K, if and only if Pratini of H is a subgroup of Pratini of K. Okay, so this is the second notion that enters again, Pratini resistant. In Pratini resistant, we want this equivalence. Okay, instead, of course, H subgroup of K always implies Pratini of H is a subgroup of Pratini of K, but the other way around. So in Pratini resistant, we want that whenever Pratini of H is a subgroup of Pratini of K, H must be a subgroup of K. So more or less, this is the condition that we need. Okay. And of course, we can analogously, we can define strongly Pratini resistant, where instead of all finitely generated subgroups, we can look at all subgroups H and K of G. But now, and so please try to keep, so these two notions until the end of this talk will be the key notions, Pratini resistant and, and Pratini injective. So what is the first observation? Clearly every strongly Fratini, every Fratini resistant property group is Fratini injective. Why? Let us assume that Fratini of H is equal to Fratini of K. Then this in particular means that Fratini of H is a subgroup of Fratini of K. So this will imply that H is a subgroup of K. On the other side, when Fratini of H is equal to Fratini of K, Fratini of K is a subgroup of Fratini of H. This would imply that K is a subgroup of H. So H must be equal to K, okay? So we see that actually, uh, at least in the definition, Pratini resistance is a stronger property, okay? And in a minute we will see, we will try to see actually that, okay, are they equivalent or not? Good, but we will try to answer this in a minute. But to see, do we have examples of Pratini resistant property groups? So the first thing is, again, let us look at our theorem. All solvable and all periodic analytic Pratini injective property groups are strongly Pratini resistant. And this is not difficult to be shown. The difficult part was with the Pratini injectivity. But here, since we know that our groups are Pratini injective and Pratini injectivity is a weaker property than Pratini resistance, it's easy to prove this theorem. So actually from now on, whenever you have a solvable or periodic analytic group, being Fratini resistant, Fratini injective, or strongly Fratini resistant, or strongly Fratini injective is an equivalent property, okay? So there is no difference in the, category, in the categories of solvable and periodic analytic groups. Good. 
But what's going on with other groups? Of course, life doesn't end with solvable and with periodic analytic groups. So the first thing that I would like to say is the following. Every free propy group is strongly Fratini resistant. Okay? And actually, this is where the whole story started. The first group that we looked at was free propy groups. There were different reasons why we were looking at free propy groups. And suddenly, we realized that such a thing happens. And then it started the whole theory. So historically, this is the most important group for me, even though it has the easiest proof why it is Fratini resistant. And I will not give a proof here, but I will tell you just quickly one line. If you have a group, propy group, with the property that all its subgroups have torsion free abelianization, then the group, it will be Fratini resistant. And of course, free propy group satisfies this property because every subgroup of a free propy group is a free propy group. Okay? Great. What next? We know that from geometry group theory, combinatorial group theory, whenever one proves something for free groups, the next thing to do is surface groups. But the surface group analogs of propy groups are the Mushkin groups. And actually, when you take a, a propy completion of a surface group, you get a Demushkin group. And just let me try to define quickly this. What is a propy group G is called the Mushkin group if it is a Poincare duality group of dimension two, or if it satisfies the following conditions. It is finitely generated, it has one relator, and the cup product from H1 times H1 to H2, when we look at the cohomologies, is a non-degenerate bilinear form. Anyway, okay, it's like a it's a technical definition, but it's a very important class of groups, in particular in number theory, algebraic number theory. But the Mushkin groups have two invariants. The first invariant is D, DG, the minimal number of generators. And the second invariant is the following. The Mushkin groups are one related groups. So if you look at their abelianization, it will have either this form. And in this case, the Mushkin group is, yes, the abelianization is torsion free or it will have this form here. So you will have some finite P group here of order cyclic P group of order PE. And this Q, it will be P in this case, or it will be zero in this case here. And the Mushkin groups can be characterized with their invariants. And the classification theorem of the Mushkin groups is a very important result proved by the Mushkin, Serent, Labiot. And I'm just putting here just to see what kind of groups can be the Mushkin groups. So Labute finished this classification. He started with the Mushkin, Serp proved very important cases involving prime two. And Labute proved in his PhD, so the PhD thesis of Labute is the last case of the classification of the Mushkin groups. So basically it has D generators, one relator, and the relators will have this shape always for P odd, but also for Q where whenever this Q when p equal to two and two is different than two. So when we look at the abelianization, if we don't have a cyclic factor of order two, then it's always we have this classification here. But if you have a cyclic factor of order two, in that case, that's the only case where d can be even or odd. And r has this shape or this shape. But we shouldn't care for this, uh, actually for the relations in particular. But what can we say for the Mushkin groups? For the Mushkin groups, we have the following theorem. Let G be a Demushkin propy group. Then the following assertions hold. If 2G is different than P, okay? So if the abelianization does not contain a factor P, where P is odd, or where 2G is P for any, so if P is odd as well, then G is strongly Fratini resistant. So basically almost always the Mushkin propy group is strongly Fratini resistant. There are, we have two more cases. Which are the cases? If 2G is equal to two and DG is greater than two, what's going on here? Then G is Fratini injective, but not Fratini resistant. So actually this is the first case. So why we need to consider Fratini resistance? So there are groups which are Fratini injective, but are not Fratini resistant. But it's still open problem. We don't know if there such groups exist for P odd, but P equal to two, Exactly those Demushkin groups provide examples. And the last thing is that if 2G is equal to two and DG is equal to two, then G is not Fratini injective. But when DG is equal to two, this is a periodic analytic group. And this group does not belong to any of the examples that we found. So that's the proof. 
the proof of the first property here is not very difficult. Actually, we try every demotion group, we can find an epimorphic image to these nice periodic analytic groups that appeared in our classification. So basically the proofs uses that idea. And if we know a little bit this theory, then it will, it's not difficult. But took a lot of time to prove the second thing. That not that this is, uh, yes, they are not Fratini resistant, but they are Fratini injected. This part is not trivial, actually it was quite tricky. Anyway, I would like to stop here with the Mushkin groups and with all these groups. And I would like to continue with the second part of my talk, actually. Of course, we are going on with the name, same thing, but we are entering to the world of algebraic number theory now. The absolute, okay, before we, I go there, is, if there is any questions so you want to ask, clear, then we can do, or we can leave all the questions for the end. Great, but please, you can stop whenever you want. You can stop me. Let us go on. The absolute Galois group of a field K is the profinite group, Gal, Galois, Ks over K, where Ks is separable closure of K. Okay, the standard definition of the absolute Galois group. And another important object is the maximal propy Galois group of K. The maximal propy Galois group of K, denoted by GKP, is the maximal propy portion of GK. Equivalently, GKP is just Galois KP over K, where KP is the compositum of all finite Galois P extensions of K inside KS, okay? So we can think either it's a Galois group of this KP, where we look at the compositum of all finite Galois P extensions of K inside KS, but this is equivalent is the maximal propy quotient of the absolute Galois group, okay? Great. But now delineating or describing absolute Galois groups of fields within the category of profinite groups or describing maximal propy Galois groups within the category of propy groups is one of the central problems of Galois theory and not just Galois theory, but also of algebraic number theory in general, okay? So usually they want to give a nice description of these two groups, but it's, we are far from these kind of things, especially in the case of absolute Galois groups. Great, but now let me state maybe our main results that we have. The first one is the following. Let K be a field containing a primitive pth root of unity. And if P is equal to two, in addition, assume that square root of minus one belongs to K. Then the maximal propy Galois group, GKP, is strongly Fratini resistant. Okay, so in particular, it is Fratini resistant. Uh, it is Fratini injective, strongly Fratini injective, okay? So maximal Galois group, propy Galois groups satisfy all the properties that we have discussed so far in this talk. And a little bit more, what can we say for the absolute Galois groups in general? So for, uh, now for any field K, so we don't uh, say anything for the restriction that the square root of minus one belongs to K and odd prime P, every propy subgroup of the absolute Galois group GK is strongly Fratini resistant. Of course, this will follow from the theory, previous theorem. Moreover, if square root of minus one belongs to K, then also every proto subgroup of GK is strongly Fratini resistant. Here, we need always to assume this condition because if this condition is not there, then the Galois group may have a torsion. C2 may appear as a finite subgroup, right? So that's why this is the condition. But anyway, we can see that actually we have these two properties. But automatically with these two properties, what can we say? Everything that we have proved for Fratini resistant propy groups or for Fratini injective propy groups actually are satisfied by these groups. So just quickly, two things. The first thing is that unit extraction of roots. I'm not sure if it was known before unit extraction of roots in maximal propy Galois groups. So this follows as a corollary of Fratini resistance. Monotonicity condition. If you look at the subgroups here, let's say at open subgroups or whatever, if you take a finitely generated subgroup and it's open subgroups, then DK is always greater or equal to DH, the minimal number of generators. So the monotonicity condition that we set in the beginning, right? So actually, and many other properties we can derive follow directly from Fratini injectiveness. But just a second, actually free-propy groups are special types of Fratini injective, of Galois groups. 
So if you take a number field, a piadic number field, a finite instruction of 2p, if it does not contain p roots of unit, its Galois group is a free property group. And actually the Mushkin groups, so if you take a piadic number field, which contains p roots of unity, then its Galois group is the Mushkin, but it's still an open problem. Is every Demushkin group realizable as a maximal Gala appropriate group? So that's why the proof for the Mushkin group does not follow from this theorem. We have to deal separately. Okay? Great. So now let me just discuss something. Let K be a field containing a primitive p root of unity. And also assume that this is equal to in case. So always we will be in this kind. So this is really what people, this is the situation, the scenario and experts want to understand. Okay? And actually in the last few decades, substantial progress has been made in the direction of finding necessary condition for a propy group to be realizable as the maximal propy Galois group of some field K, okay? But the deepest result actually, most notably, it follows from the positive solution of the block cut of conjecture by Rost and Wojewodski that every maximal propy Galois group is quadratic. In other words, the cohomology algebra the cohomology algebra uh, of this Galois group is generated by elements of degree one and defined by homogeneous relation of degree two. So actually we consider this as a graded algebra, okay? And so it will be generated by elements of degree one and is defined by homogeneous relations of degree two. Anyway, a technical notion, those who are dealing with uh, people that have deal with this kind of rings, they know what is going on. But this is a very strong property, okay? And in the Galois group, every open subgroup of a maximal propy Galois group, or even every closed, is a maximal propy Galois group. So Galois groups satisfy the property that all their open subgroups are quadratic. And actually it has been, it is still an open problem. Uh, actually, okay. Uh, in some sense, what kind of other groups we can get among which have the property that are hereditarily quadratic? I will discuss this at the end, maybe a little bit, but I just wanted to say that this is the deepest result. And actually, Boyabotsky received a Fields Medal for the techniques that he developed actually around these kind of questions. Okay? But now, in contrast to the hitherto investigated properties of maximal propy Galois groups, Pratini injectivity is a fairly elementary and quite palpable group theoretic condition, yet it seems to be highly restrictive. So actually, whatever we talked so far, everything I guess it was understandable. I didn't say anything. I didn't use any too advanced theory, right? But it really turns out that Pratini injectivity is quite restrictive as well. And actually, within the category of periodic analytic groups and solvable property groups, Pratini injectivity characterizes maximal propy Galois groups. Basically, we have the following corollary of our results. Let G be a solvable apiadic analytic propy group. Then G is Pratini injective. If and only if it is isomorphic to a maximal propy Galois group of a field K that contains a primitive fifth root of unity. And also contains fourth root of unity if P is equal to two. Okay, so this follows from Pratini injectivity and why? We showed that Galois groups, maximal Galois groups are Pratini inject. Okay, so if you take a solvable or periodic analytic Galois group, it will be Pratini injective, but we already have classification of Pratini injective, periodic and solvable analytic groups. And it is not difficult that, to see that all these groups could be realized as maximal Galois appropriate groups. And that's it, this is the proof. Moreover, using Pratini injectivity, we were able to prove many of the results known in the literature for maximal Gala appropriate groups. I will try to mention just few, okay? So the first thing is the following result. Let G be a solvable or periodic analytic appropriate group. Then G can be realized as a maximal appropriate Gala group of stuff field K that contains a primitive fifth root of unity and the fourth root of unity P is equal to two when if and only it is a free abelian propy group or isomorphic to a semi-direct product that we already discussed, okay? So just those kind of groups can appear. And actually this result was proved by War, it was a whole paper in 1992, but with the assumption that K contains P squared root of unity. 
Okay. This is an assumption, assumption. Then Quadrelli in 2014, in his thesis, he managed to show that if he assumes that G is finitely generated, then he doesn't need to have P squared of unity inside. And then in 2020, he showed that uh, actually, yeah, one can take out what they do even for infinitely generated groups. But actually all these results, they follow directly from Fratini injectivity. And as you noticed in Fratini injectivity, I never use the word finitely generated. I never use P is equal to two or P is equal to P is odd. So actually we prove for all the primes and all the situation and it gives us this result. Anyway, I will try to mention just one more result in this direction. This is the one. Let K be a field containing a primitive field field of unity then the maximal Galois appropriate group contains a unique maximal normal abelian subgroup. And actually why? You remember that this special theorem that I said, one of the properties of Fratini injectivity, which said that it contains a unique maximal property Galois, a unique maximal abelian subgroups. So this is just a result of that. But Engler, who is a retired professor from Campinas, uh, in 1994 with Nogueira, they proved this result for P equal to two. So they have the paper which deals exactly with this question. And later on Engler and Koenigsmann in 1998, they managed to prove this result for all primes. But as I said, this is a direct corollary of our result. And there are many other results of this type, but I would like to go to discuss to something else because we don't have much time. So once again, let K be a field containing a primitive pith root of unity and also assume that square root of minus one belongs to K if P is equal to two. In the 90s, Ido Efrat conjectured that if the maximal propy Galois group is finitely generated, then it is of elementary type. What does it mean of elementary type? The GKP, the maximal propy Galois groups can be constructed from ZP and the Mushkin groups using free propy products and certain semi-direct products, known also as a fiber product. And this is the so-called elementary type conjecture. Okay, here I don't mention free propy groups, but the free propy group of rank K, we can get as a free product of K copies of ZP, okay? So Efra's conjecture says that all maximal propy Galois groups must be of elementary type. So we must be able to construct them just using ZP and the Mushkin groups. Okay, and but this is still open. It is known for some cases, let's say like number fields and so on, but it's still generally open. It's, uh, and it has been open for more than 30 years for more or less. But actually, let me try to say what is this related with our work a little bit. So first of all, every propy group of elementary type is strongly Fratini resistant. Okay, so all the groups that we can build in this way are strongly Fratini resistant. And, and okay, the proof of this result actually uses a result of Weigel, Quadrelli and some other people which deal with smoothness. They show that all Galois, maximal Galois propy groups are smooth, but with Splobodan we proved that every smooth propy group must be Fratini resistant, strongly Fratini resistant. But I don't want to discuss smoothness here. It is a very cohomological concept. It's very beautiful, but it's technical. I will try to skip that. But now, okay, every propy group of elementary type is strongly Fratini resistant. And what can we say? We have this, we leave this open problem. So there are many open problems from this theory, but this is the question. Is there a finitely generated strongly Fratini resistant propy group, which is not of elementary type? Okay. I believe that the answer is no, it's negative. There does not exist such a group. And a negative answer to the above question would settle the elementary type conjecture. Okay, so this was the real inspiration for all this work that we have done. But nevertheless, even if the answer is yes, then for sure, the counter examples will give, likely will be, will be propy groups with very exotic properties, okay? So this is more or less the moral of this. This problem is really a very important problem to work on. Either one gets the elementary type conjecture, settles that, or gets new classes of property group with exotic properties. Anyway, you remember that I said that the deepest result are the result of Wojewodski and Rost, that Galois groups have the property that all their open subgroups are quadratic. Such groups are called block cutter groups, okay? And the thing is that it is known that every group of elementary type is block cutter, but it does not know the other way around. 
Are there any block cutoff groups which are not of elementary type as described by EFTA, which could not, not be built from ZP and the Muslim groups? And this is a very important question. And actually my intuition says that, if, it's, if I'm not wrong, uh, that Pratini, Prati, strongly Pratini resistance, block cutoff, elementary type more or less will be the same thing, okay? But of course, to solve this problem, it's a little bit difficult. And one has to think on certain families of groups where one should try to check this problem. And uh, what is going on, you should keep in mind that we have this monotonicity condition. And the monotonicity condition actually is very strong. If you give me, let's say, arithmetic groups, which are not periodic analytic, automatically I will say that they cannot be here. And many other groups, but people that work in combinatorial tropy group theory and combinatorial group theory in general, they know that such monotonicity conditions usually comes from free product, but also from amalgamations or procyclic amalgamations or HNN &N products or so on, okay? So now I see that I have three more minutes and I will try to say some few, few words in this direction. And this is a work that I have done with Pavel. Okay, it's a pandemic work. We have done this work in April and May with an intensive collaboration during the first two months of the quarantine period. Anyway, what is this thing is the following. Let me just quickly define what is a right angle art in group. So let gamma be a simplician graph with vertex set V gamma and edge set E gamma. The right angled art in group G gamma associated to gamma is the group with the following presentation. Is generated by the vertices and its relations are what? UV, the commutator UV is equal to one if and only if UV is an edge, okay? So to understand better, if you take this V gamma without edges, it's a graph just with vertices, it will be just a free group of prank the number of vertices. But if you take gamma to be a complete graph where every two vertices are connected, this will be a free abelian group, okay? So right angle arting groups are somewhere in between, but right angle arting groups have a very rich subgroup structure. Actually, the fundamental group of every hyperbolic manifold is a right angle arting group. It could be embedded inside the right angle arting group, or on the other side, if you have a one related groups with torsion, they could be embedded there, or all virtual special groups could be embedded there. So that's why they played a key role in the solution of virtual Arkham conjecture by Agor. But now experts started to think about this quadraticity problem, where one can find maybe block cathode probe groups, hereditarily quadratic groups, but which are not of elementary type. And one thing was that they thought to look at probe completion of the right angle art in groups. Okay, and there was a certain conjecture there. So let me state the main result, what you proved with Fabel. Let G be the proper completion of the right angled arting group, G gamma. Then the following assertions are equivalent. So G is just the proper completion of the right angle arting group, G gamma. And actually proper completion determines the right angle proper group. So it's a result of Krop Holler and Bilkis that if you have two different gammas, then the proper completion will be different. Okay, cannot be isomorphic. Then in this case, what do we have? No induced subgraph of gamma is either of these two forms, okay? This is equivalent to every open subgroup of G is quadratic. G occurs as a maximal proper Galois group of some field K containing a primitive fifth root of unity. G can be constructed from ZP just by iterating two group theoretic operations, direct products with ZP and free proper products. And at the end, every open subgroup of GS torsion free abelianization. What do we see here? We see actually it was conjectured that the first property and the second property are equivalent. It was conjectured by Weigel and Quadrelli. And this settles Weigel Quadrelli conjecture. But actually, many experts thought that here there will be possible candidates to find the groups which are hereditarily quadratic, but actually. Uh, are not realizable at Galois groups or are not realizable, do not satisfy the elementary type conjecture. And actually we proved here, no. In this class of groups, there is no chance to get that. And let me just make the last discussion for the last property. 
If you see here, every open subgroup of G has torsion free abelianization. What does this mean? In particular, it means that G is Pratini resistant, strongly Pratini resistant, okay? Because as I said, all propy groups with the property that every subgroup has torsion free abelianization are Pratini resistant. And actually, I think that here we can add also in this equivalence Pratini resistance. I know how to do it in my head, more or less, but there are some details, and I have a student who works in similar problems now. Okay, I think that it's time to finish. Thank you very much for your attention. So uh, please, thanks Emir for this good talk, for the talk. Now, time for the questions. Some questions, comments? Well, I have two questions actually. Yes. Uh, can you go to the last slide? Yes. Uh, this uh, property five, uh, does it imply also uh, strong uh, Fratini resistance or only Fratini resistance? Okay, so you, this is a good, wonderful question actually, and also to say something more. Uh, if you have a Fratini, finitely generated Fratini resistant group, then it's automatically strongly Fratini resistant, okay? So I didn't mention many technical details. We, we express all our notions in a different language, completely different language. And we use those tools to prove things. So finitely generated Fratini resistant group is strongly Fratini. However, it is not clear if finitely generated a Fratini injected group is strongly Fratini injected, okay? So that's why this is an open problem. It is stated in our paper. Is it true that every finitely generated Fratini injected group is strongly Fratini injected? But of course, in this case, this property five, it implies Fratini resistance, but Fratini, this is, those groups are finitely generated, so they are strongly Fratini resistant, and every strongly Fratini resistant is strongly Fratini injected. So you get all the properties in this property five. Oh, ah, yeah, but uh, um, you, uh, you mentioned your theorems with uh, uh, with Slobodan about uh, uh, Galois groups, but yes. I remember some of them were known to be uh, have this property five. Yes, but those are very restrictive. You have the you have that they have. So you see, this is a beautiful paper by Wilfred. He defines mm -hmm. the notion of absolutely torsion free, right? So Wilfred says the following. This is the theorem. You take K, a field K, okay? and assume that K contains all possible p fruits of unity, okay? Uh, okay. That the maximal Galois propy group, in this case, will be absolutely torsion free. But actually this also follows, this is one of the results, this follows from my results with Slobodan as well. Okay, so we have a notion of commutator resistant as well that I skipped to discuss. And all these absolutely torsion free are commutator resistant, but if you, throw in all these p fruits of unity and more or less from commutative resistance is clear that they will be torsion free abelianization all the time. All the subgroups have that. But yes, this is the absolutely torsion free group. And actually that is the only paper that I know that someone has ever thought in something that we have thought now. So I, I am not aware of any work. If no, anyone has ever considered why when two subgroups, two Pratini groups are equal. So I have never seen in the literature in any way. And I will be very happy to know that, okay, maybe these old people, let's say like Higman, Neumann, these people, they, they have thoughts sometimes or something similar, but there is no written evidence for these kind of things. Okay, okay. and uh, my second question is related to this elementary type conjecture. Yes. Because in elementary type conjecture, it sort of eliminates that uh, says that any decent amalgamation uh, shouldn't uh, shouldn't be Galois group, right? And more or less it is known, all right? But uh, have you investigated if you take some amalgamation, what amalgamation can uh, preserve this Fratini resistance or not? Or no, actually you see, this is the, we haven't dealt with amalgamations. Actually, in, you see in our paper, we, we put many results and we, we don't try so, Okay, the original version of the paper like, was six, 60, 70 pages, and we just brought it to 33. But we know many things, but not with amalgams. And you know that this was the exact reason why we were dealing with this theorem that we proved, right? I took this. So we were trying to understand, and here we have an amalgam, right? 
And so yeah, you remember our yeah, discussion, you were insisting that it will be, right? Yeah. yeah, so this was the thing, and you were insisting that it would be absolutely torsion free. And it gives you the impression that the, in this case, the right proper completion of the right angle groups, proper uh, right angle arting group associated here, it will be, but I was telling you all the time that no, it cannot. But I was just following my intuition and my, so, okay. I, I just acted as a faithful person, you know, <laughs> just to say that, okay, it cannot be, but you are acting with this, but then it, at the end, it turned out that I was right. And I still believe that it will not happen, but those are the right questions, exactly. So one, the first question, serious question to think is this amalgamated thing. And actually, uh, to be honest, yes, I'm waiting to finish this semester with a lot of teaching. And the first thing that I will do next semester is exactly to try to understand these kind of things and to try to attack the problem. Yeah, but this is the right thing. So actually one possible thing to look at are limit groups, right? Because you and Desi, you prove this monotonicity but, condition. Yeah, but, 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 but limit groups can have torsion, uh, abilis, uh, torsion and abelianization. One has to go to special limit groups, so special- Yeah, 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 I know. So this is the point, but we don't care for that. We want to show that it can never happen unless it is of elementary type. So this is the point, exactly. But I want to say that's another natural category of groups to look at it. So limit groups, because in limit groups, you already have this nice monotonicity result. Because I know that if, if someone comes to me and tells me, okay, you have this group, and can you tell me, can it, can it be realized as a maximal Galois property group? I think that in five minutes, most of the time, I will give the answer that it is not. And the way how I see is this monotonicity condition. And actually, it's very interesting. There have been a few papers published in very top journals recently, right? Where they just say, okay, the following families of groups could not be realized at maximal proper Galois groups. But actually, with Fratini injectivity, you get this immediately. You just throw them out, and that's it. And, and, and monotonicity condition plays a really big role. So if free proper groups, it holds. The Mushin groups, it holds. But those are very nice groups. And in free products, and those nice semi-direct products, it behaves nicely. But what's going on with other? So you know that why I was, we deal with this problem here, because I wanted to inspire you that this problem makes sense. And let us go and work to the other direction and let us try to finish the elementary type conjecture. So I hope that we will be able now to continue in this direction to work on that. Okay, any other questions? I have a, a question, but I don't know if it's possible to think about it. Uh, in a case of the maximal property uh, Galois group, there yes. are some, some characterization in some sense, the sharpness of the relations in a group. With the, what kind of relations they will have? Yeah, there are some yeah, sharpness. This is a very nice question. Uh, condition to... Yeah, yeah, this is a very nice question. This is a beautiful question. And actually, you see, this is a point. Uh, okay, now it is easy to answer this question because is this Wojewodski Rost result? So if you go back just a second, we have this Rost Wojewodski result, right? So we say here that the cohomology algebra is generated by elements of degree one and defined by homogeneous relation of degree two. This is in homology, but in cohomology algebra. But we know that in a tropy group, H1 is what? Generators. H2 yes. are the relations, right? So actually, what does this mean? Then the, so we have the whole cohomology ring is generated by elements of degree one and defined by homogeneous relations of degree two. Actually, we can get to see that if you look at Fratini series. So, okay, you have Fratini, G1 is Fratini of G. G2 is Fratini of Fratini of G. G3 is Fratini of Fratini of Fratini of G, right? So we have this Fratini series, it's a filtration. So if you look at the relations, these that homogeneous relations of degree two, it exactly means that you can always find a presentation where the relations are of degree two. They cannot be of degree three, but let me make this simplest. What are relations of degree two? Commutator is a relation of degree two. It's inside Fratini, but it's not outside, right? And basically what is going on? But the third commutator 
It's not a relation of degree two. So modulo, so basically modulo of the third Pratini or modulo of the third lower P central series, we will have X to the P, X one to the P, X two to the P, this kind of relation and just commutators of order two. So all these maximal propigala groups have these kind of relations. You can never see a relation which has only a commutator of degree three, right? Or P power times a commutator of degree three. Such a thing cannot happen. So more or less uh, for the relation we know, but just knowing the relation they can still not prove is difficult. I think that, I, I believe that you see the point is because it involves cohomology. This is not a very easy theory. So it's not easy to understand these things. So that's why we really wanted to give a more, more group theoretic approach to these kind of things. And at the end, I think that we are quite happy. It turned out to be quite efficient. So we believe that this will add the, with, this will push things further, but we will see. It's not clear yet. Thanks. Yeah, and thank also you. the way you described it, it is sort of formal type of relation. It is not really, really relations in precisely. Yes. Yeah, I think that you see, it's difficult to, so in the Mushkin group, you see, you have a precise relation, but actually this question of Shayla, it helped us a lot with Pavel. So in our proof, we use this thing. Exactly, this is the trick. So whenever we, we have this theorem of Pavel, when we look actually at this group, we look at L3, we take the right angle arcing group here, we look at the property completion. So basically we use Busser theory, but the trick is that, that at some point we will get using Busser theory, we will get a relation which is not quadratic, which is not of the type that I was saying. So exactly we'll get like third commutator more or less, and that gives it out. So that's why this was the proof that we did. But in general, this is a very concrete example, but to give a nice description in general, it's not easy. And so there are papers that's like Minach and his collaborators have been writing a couple of papers, and Efrat also, I think, in this direction. More of the questions? If not, let's thank again to Elif, please. Okay. The microphone. Oh. Thank you very much to all of you for your attention. It was great to talk here. Uh, Eli, Actually, Eli, Eli. may I have, may I ask a question? Of course. I sorry, my microphone was off. Uh, on the first theorem on periodic analytic groups, you mentioned mm -hmm. that in order for this group to have a torsion-free periodic analytic group to have um, Fratini resistance, the action on the semi-direct product must be by this kind of periodic yeah. unit. Yeah. If we take P equals two, uh, why is the reason we can't take the, the action by a negative factor? So one minus four, well, let me or tell one, you minus one of the reasons. Minus one to the... Yes, okay. Let me tell you my one philosophical and general reason. Do you know the definition of a powerful group? So yes, why so when we have a powerful group, we say that a powerful group, GP, is G is powerful if G to the P is inside the commutator. Is if the commutator is inside the G to the P. But if P is equal to two, we say that the commutator is inside G to the four. Or in some sense, we want to say that G modulo GP is abelian, but G modulo G2 is always abelian. Every group of exponent two is abelian. So this is one of the things, but the point is that in many proofs, what is the problem is that P divides P choose two, but two does not divide two choose two, yeah. uh, two choose two, because two choose two, combinatorial thing, P times P minus one over two. P always divides that if P is odd, but two does not divide that because that's one. When So this is the reason why in the whole theory of periodic and articular groups, two makes a trouble, okay? This is the point. But on the other side, when you look at this negative one, then you will see that uh, actually, you will see that you can see that the group is not periodic analytic. You can play with it. It's not Pratini injective. You can take two different elements and you will see that it is not. But the real reason is exactly whatever I told you. The real reason is that in P odd, P always defines, divides P choose two, but when P is equal to two, this is not anymore true. So that's why if you see, even in maximal Propigalois groups, 
almost all the papers. So either they build P equal to two or they build P out. So that's why we are very happy. And we really insisted until the end, just to publish this paper when we will complete everything. So Pavel knows that I have been telling him for many time, we will do it, we will do it. But we really wanted to deal with everything. And now we are happy with the picture, right? So it really covers all the primes. But yeah, this was a nice, uh, this is a nice question. Why it does not hold there? And, and, but there is also one other thing. So even with this constant number of generators, it is not, it cannot be constant number of generators in that case as well. So you will have like, yeah, it's a, uh, there is, there are some other problematic things that may appear. Okay, good. So let's then get, oh, some more other questions. Okay. So if not, let's thank again, Lee.